Hello there. My name is Dr. Rebecca Gilbert, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at American Parkinson Disease Association. Thank you so much for joining us for our Dr. Gilbert host series, during which we're discussing important issues regarding COVID-19 and how it impacts people with Parkinson's disease. American Parkinson's Disease Association, or APDA for short, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and works tirelessly to help the approximately 1 million people with PD in the United States live life to the fullest in the face of this chronic neurologic disease. Please visit us our, at our website at apdaparkinson.org to explore all that we have to offer. And this includes programs and services delivered by our network of chapters and information on referral centers located throughout the US. Our website also hosts a vast array of publications, webinars, articles, and information that can help you understand your Parkinson's disease. Another way to contact APDA is through our toll-free helpline at 1-800-223-2732. And now for today's program. Today, we will be discussing PD medication management and COVID-19. Many people with PD and their care partners have specific questions that have arisen during this time with regard to their PD medication. My guest today who will help us answer some of these questions is Kathy Thomas, MSRN. Ms. Thomas is an assistant clinical professor of neurology and program director of the Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorder Center at Boston University Medical Campus. As a clinical nurse specialist in neuroscience, she has developed novel programs for Parkinson's disease participated extensively in Parkinson's disease research trials, and most importantly, delivered evidence-based and highly individualized care to people with PD and families. Ms. Thomas is also program coordinator of the American Parkinson Disease Association Information and Referral Center at BU. And she has participated in over 250 presentations to professional and lay groups. She regularly speaks to support groups, and educates healthcare professionals about PD. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, go ahead. So we have a, a whole bunch of questions that have previously been submitted to us that we will be discussing. And these are the topics uh, that we hope to hit on today. So concerns regarding PD meds and COVID-19, medications for anxiety that uh, may be necessary during social distancing, any medication changes during social distancing, financial and supply concerns that relate to PD medications, and very importantly, keeping medications organized during social distancing. Now, most importantly, if you are watching this online, or live, I should say, and you have a question for us, whether it fits into one of these categories or not, please feel free to enter it using the question and answer feature on your Zoom app, and we will hopefully answer it during this session. At this time, I would love to ask Kathy to give us an overview about how to keep oneself organized with their medications, especially during this difficult time. Kathy. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for providing this opportunity. Um, I've really enjoyed participating and in, in watching many of the webinars and um, communications that APDA has provided, so thank you so much. I know the format is questions and answers, which is really exciting, um, but I did want to just have two slides to talk a little bit about how I, when I work with um, patients and families, how I um, teach strategies to stay organized and on time. Okay, so the very first thing is to take inventory of all of your medications. Um, this would include the name of the medications, the date that they're prescribed, the actual dosage, um, the desired action. And what I mean by that is when a physician prescribes a medication, it's very, very important for a person to understand why they're taking that medication. For example, with the Parkinson medication, it may simply be that the physician wants to better regulate your tremor. So they may prescribe a medication um, to do that. 
And you as the person taking the medication really have to have a good understanding on what the action is. So that's part of taking inventory of your personal schedule. There are also special considerations with many medications. Do I take this medicine with food? Do I take it at a certain time of day? So we encourage all individuals to self-manage their medications. Sometimes it may mean that you may need some assistance with that, um, but everybody um, should play a role in, in how to best manage medications. We encourage people to keep a list of all of your medications, actually maybe one, two or three lists. Um, sometimes it's nice to have one at home, one that you might keep in your um, wallet or purse, um, and one maybe with a family member. Um, and this should include all of your medicines, your medicines for Parkinson's, your medicines that maybe treat some um, side effects of Parkinson's, your medicines for other health conditions, and many people take vitamins or supplements, so everything should be part of the list. We also encourage people to create a dosing schedule chart. Um, for example, um, we know that many Parkinson medications are not given once a day. You may take it, you know, a few times during the day, sometimes up to 10 times a day. So you should know really the time that you take it and, and sort of plot out your day on some type of chart. And we have many, many resources for charts um, that we are certainly um, willing to share with you. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Okay, and just some final tips to stay organized and on time. Um, I always, when I'm teaching a person, um, ask them to take one day during the week to review their medication schedule and organize for the upcoming week. Um, I've actually, in my practice, have seen it all. Some people go from dose to dose and they don't kind of feel organized on where all of the medications are for the next dose. But if you can do it, say, on a Sunday evening or um, at a time that is quiet and really plan ahead and ask yourself questions, do I have enough supply? Um, are they organized in a way that I can easily access them? And just we have many, many um, tips on how to do that, um, whether it's using pill organizers such as displayed here, this um, multi-compartment pill box. Um, you know, these are quite helpful in, in planning ahead so that if you're going about, um, you know, your daily activities, you're not, you know, at the last minute sort of scrambling for your, for your next dose and where it is. Um, we also um, want to help our patients identify strategies to self-manage their medicines to take them on time. And oftentimes when you, as I mentioned before, if you take more than um, one dose a day, you need to have reminders so that you can stay on time. And there are many applications that um, help. Um, some people use a watch, some people, you know, have a chart visible, you know, on their refrigerator. Um, whatever will work for you so that you can do the best to take your medications on time. We know that not everyone is perfect and sometimes you are delayed. Um, but we feel that the best you can do will, will provide a better outcome for you. Okay. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I think both of us have noticed that in this particular time of uh, social distancing and staying home, th these issues of keeping your medications organized are particularly difficult. People feel that time passes without a good organization plan. There aren't as many uh, markers in the day of when to do things. And so these issues are sort of coming to a head during this period. Have you been finding that as well? Yes, I, I think just even personally being organized and um, knowing the time of day and the day of the week um, takes some extra effort for certain, um, really a, a, um, 
consideration that I've had to make several times a day. Okay. So let's uh, let's go to our question and answer. We have a a, a question that that uh, was submitted that's very relevant to the slides you just showed. What happens if I am late for a dose of medication? Should I take my dose when I remember, or should I wait for my next dose? Really common question. What do you? Mm -hmm. What advice do you give about that? Yes, and that's a common question often. Um, that um, so generally, if it's um, a medication such as levodopa that actually improves your motor symptoms. We, um, and we teach patients to take the dose when they remember it. Um, so it may be an hour later, um, and sometimes you remember it because your symptoms emerge and you say, oh my goodness, um, I'm slower now because I didn't take my medication an hour ago. Um, so yeah, so take it then, and that may be, Require some calculation um, the remainder of the day, um, and and typically people can catch up quite easily. Um, so you kind of sense where you are. Um, as with anything, it's very individualized. Um, but the concern for most people is if they're late taking their levodopa or medications covering a period of time. Um, so we have a question about levodopa that has come in from Fred. Um, what is the rule of thumb for taking levodopa or brand name Cinemet with a meal that has protein in it? Can you give some guidance about protein, maybe an introduction about what he's referring to and how to navigate that issue? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, um, Fred, and one that we often um, learn about. Um, so yeah, so oftentimes a physician will prescribe um, your levodopa to be taken um, a half hour um, before your, your dose, before you um, eat. Um, so actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. <laughs> um, to take your levodopa on an empty stomach. So you want to um, make sure you take it before you have your meal. Um, and the reason for that is that it works better. Um, levodopa is absorbed in the small intestine. And we know that foods, um, particularly foods high in proteins, may compete with the absorption of levodopa. So um, we want patients to, or people to take it on an empty stomach. Um, there are always rules. Um, you know, sometimes people experience nausea. But really the um, nice thing about this question is that this is the type of question that you'd want to have a discussion when your medications are um, prescribed. And your healthcare provider can give you this information. You know, here, this is the dose that I want you to take during the day, and this is how you should take it. Um, most often, it is prescribed at least a half hour before meals. Not everyone has um, protein sensitivity, but um, if you do, um, and I also find that um, people oftentimes self-learn this. Um, they take a dose, if, they, if it competes with protein, they don't get the same outcome as they normally would. Yeah, I, I definitely found that too, that uh, some people figure this out, that protein is a problem and some people don't, and you just have to listen to your, your body. If it's not an issue for you, you're lucky and you can eat what you want with your, with your doses. Mm -hmm. It's uh, variable, yeah. Um, so we have uh, a couple of questions that have come in um, specifically about this, this time period and medications. And this, this I think, is a, a great one to, um, to explore. I am much less financially secure than prior to this crisis. And for the first time, I am worrying about the cost of my medication. Mm -hmm. Do you have ideas for resources to help me afford my medication? Mm -hmm. So certainly another great question. And you know, we feel financial health is a really important part of wellness. Um, and we know that it can trigger anxiety and, and um, depression and lots of other um, feelings um, when you don't feel confident in your financial state. 
We also know that um, Parkinson medications can be um, expensive. Health insurance is expensive. Um, we want to be able to have the best plan for an individual so that they can get what they need as part of their health care and, and be able to afford it. Um, one of the first things I always suggest to people is to really let your health care provider know what your financial constraints may be. Sometimes people are um, a, a little bit shy to do that. Um, just that you know you're on a fixed income or you just don't have the resources. Sometimes people are concerned that they won't be offered the best or the newest or the latest medications, which in some cases can be more expensive than um, some of the older medications. Nevertheless, it's really important for your healthcare provider to know this. Um, we also have a lot of different resources for medication assistance. Um, and um, there are medication assistance programs, nonprofits that um, provide assistance. We also, if um, a physician is um, prescribing a new medication, we oftentimes, um, if we learn after getting prior authorization for the medication that the copay may be more expensive or um, you know, it's very costly, we will work sometimes with the actual um, um, company that makes the medication. So that's another resource to be able to get assistance. Um, there are also a number of different programs like through AARP and your own self-insurance companies that um, can help alleviate some costs. Um, so it's important um, to recognize the problem, discuss it with your physician, and then research um, resources to help you do that. Um, as Dr. Gilbert mentioned, I um, coordinate services for our information referral center. So we get a lot of calls, um, and this is the INR centers that are supported by the American Parkinson Disease Association. So that's another good resource um, um, to speak, particularly because from state to state, there may be some different programs. Um, Finally, um, contact your area agency on aging. Um, they have a lot of good services to connect you with the right people. Um, so there are things that you can do. That's great information. So people don't have to just capitulate and say, can't afford it. There are uh, numerous avenues to try to help people afford their medication. Exactly. That's really fantastic. Um, we have a question that's come in from Eileen. Uh, what is your take on generic versus brand name medication? Yes, and yes, another excellent question. And um, so, so generics, um, there are brand names, and some people have taken brand name medications for a long time, feeling that they work well, um, and that maybe they've tried a generic and it, they thought perhaps it didn't work as well as the brand name. But we are now, for many, many reasons, whether it's production of brand name medications um, or insurance requirements, we now um, oftentimes have to take generic medications. And the reality is most, most, most often they work. Um, they um, work very, very well. And sometimes it may mean that the um, physician has to make some slight titrations and dosing, um, but it's really based on what the person experiences. Um, so so in, at least in Parkinson care, um, generics have worked very, very well. Um, sometimes when generics are switched from one to the next, um, a patient will contact us and say, oh, I, I feel like this is a little bit differently. And, and some patients have worked with their pharmacies to see if they could keep the same consistent um, type of medication. For example, carbidopa, levodopa, um, you know, a number of different um, generics are made. So, so it's trial and error, but for the most part, um, not too much of a problem. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, here's a, an extremely common question that uh, all of us have been fielding, and I, I know we've discussed this offline, and um, both of us have had this question posed to us. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around COVID-19 for the whole world, um, and of course, including our for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, so the question was, I'm feeling very anxious during this time, more than I have ever felt, and I think I now need a medication for anxiety. What mm -hmm. should I do? And mm -hmm. uh, embedded in this question is, I don't want to go to my doctor right now mm -hmm. to have an appointment. So mm -hmm. how do I address this uh, evolving symptom? Yes, um, really great question. And, and probably the good news is your, your doctors are coming to you, just like we're doing right now, which has been a whole new <coughs> learning experience. Um, for people, but um, I think certainly reach out to your healthcare provider, um, let them know um, about an increase in anxiety, uh, understand that this is not unusual, and we know anxiety and depression are very common um, in Parkinson's, but this added um, uncertainty can certainly increase that. Um, so I think reach out to your healthcare provider. We are um, challenged in, in, in our setting, and I'm sure a lot of settings, um, to make sure that we, you know, have somebody um, answering the telephone and receiving notes. Um, Oftentimes you can actually even write to your healthcare provider if you're involved where you have sort of a my chart or some kind of communication depart, um, you know, system set up. So send them a note or give them a call um, and they will certainly um, work with you on that. Um, it's probably a good point to mention that yes, medications are available to help. But you know, sometimes there are non-pharmacological things one can do to decrease anxiety and, and certainly um, be familiar with those, um, you know, meditation and um, you know, calling a friend and lots of different things. Um, but definitely connect with your health provider and um, it's not uncommon to um, receive a medication for this. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, another question related to this COVID-19 social distancing era, which is that my Parkinson's disease symptoms seem to be worse now, and uh, I feel like I need to be increasing my dose. Should I increase my dose uh, because of this time period or not, and how to navigate that? Mm -hmm. So, so once again, it's really important to connect with your health provider so that you can kind of figure out why this might be happening. And, and um, you know, it could be that uh, maybe you're not feeling well or you have, um, um, you know, an infection or a cold or something or um, that you're is impacting your Parkinson's symptoms. We just previously talked about anxiety and, and that in itself can impact your um, Parkinson's symptoms. People we know are not exercising to the level that they may have been. Um, so just decreased um, movement can impact how you're doing. Decreased sleep. So it's, it's really um, looking at everything that's going on and your your healthcare provider can help you sort of think about things and certainly they'd want to do a check just to to make certain you don't have um, a cause of making your symptoms worse and then from there they would recommend um, that you take your you know a certain schedule of medications maybe increase something decrease something um, and they can do that fairly quickly, so through a phone call. I briefly mentioned that many um, neurologists are now doing telehealth visits, so this might be an opportunity to have a visit. Um, and those are generally um, um, covered by your health insurance plan during this time and can be arranged, you know, probably sooner than a traditional appointment and you don't actually have to leave the house to do that, so. Great, 
So again, many options to help navigate. We have a, a question that has come in about increasing levodopa. So this person has increased levodopa by a small amount recently, and then experienced sleep disruption right after with uh, increasing dreams and loud mm -hmm. talking in my sleep. Mm -hmm. Might the increase in medication and the sleep disruption be connected? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, certainly it could be. Um, and, and once again, a, a, a brief check-in with your healthcare provider. Um, if the sometimes at your last visit or when the change is made, the healthcare provider will say, if this symptom is worse, then decrease back to what you are on. So that information that we talked about on the very first slide can be helpful. But yes, this is a new symptom that, um, you know, we do know that levodopa can, um, you know, cause some problems during sleep. Um, and, and, and other side effects also. Okay, um, so we have another question that's just come in from Jane, and this is a question that uh, we've been asked with uh, many, many permutations. So during this period of, of COVID-19, are people with Parkinson's disease who go to the emergency room for, let's say, COVID-19 symptoms or otherwise, are they considered at higher risk from COVID-19 than other people? Mm -hmm. Really good question. Um, so, you know, and, and I don't know the specific answer other than, um, you know, certainly um, Parkinson's impacts um, in many cases older individuals, not all cases. Um, so yes, we do have evidence that um, individuals over the age of 60, um, may be at a higher risk. Um, there's not an autoimmune aspect where we hear about certain conditions. And maybe Dr. Gilbert, you can answer that a little better. Well, what I, what I tend to, to say is exactly what, what you were saying. So there, we don't have evidence that Parkinson's disease uh, lowers your immunity in a way that, you know, let's say being on certain medications or anti-rejection or whatnot, it doesn't make you more likely to contract a virus. But once you have contracted the virus, your body is different than other people's and may put you at mm -hmm. risk. Um, and I think the data is coming in now. You know, we have a lot of data from all over the world about heart disease and diabetes and respiratory illness. And it seems mm -hmm. very clear that those conditions increase the risk of complications. Um, we all kind of feel in our bones that uh, having uh, at least more advanced PD symptoms would impact how COVID-19 affects um, mm -hmm. uh, your ability to deal with the virus, much like it affects lots of uh, health conditions, other respiratory illnesses, et cetera. Um, and now I think that the data is going to support that, that we're going to see um, the fact that having Parkinson's disease and other neurologic conditions mm -hmm. are going to increase the complications once COVID-19 is contracted. Um, and so, you know, to the person who asked the question, I would consider yourself to be at higher risk than someone else, mm -hmm. uh, even of the same age. And certainly, as you were saying, the age in and of itself is enough to, uh, to put you in that, in that higher bracket. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Uh, stay, stay safe. And, and you're right, um, information is coming in daily and, you know, reading some geriatric information, um, the presentation can be different um, for older populations and um, the onset of confusion or delirium um, are really any evidence of that whatsoever. It's, it's really imperative that you reach out to your primary health physician to um, just say something's not right um, and just to be checked out because perhaps the presentation is a little bit different than um, what we see in other populations. And you raise a very good point that people with neurologic conditions in general, and certainly we see this with Parkinson's disease, if you have an underlying um, or in intercurrent, as we say, medical illness, a urinary tract infection, whatnot, 
one of the things that you might experience is a worsening of your Parkinson's symptoms and not necessarily the typical, as you were saying, the typical symptoms that one would expect with the urinary tract infection. So you, you have your worsening of your Parkinson's and you say, do I have a urinary tract infection? And here in this uh, COVID-19 situation, you might want to consider COVID-19 as a possibility that um, is, is making your Parkinson's disease right. in the exactly. moment and suddenly. So just uh, you know, something to, as you were saying, contact your care, your care provider if, that, if, if you're having a sudden worsening of your Parkinson's symptoms or a new symptom that can't explain, you, know, you want to think broadly about what may be going on. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question uh, that has come in, um, amantadine. So this is a medication that was originally way back, developed for flu uh, as an influenza. And, um, and, and we now know when we use it for Parkinson's disease and for dyskinesias as well. Um, and so this, the, the comment was, on, I'm on amantadine for my Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Will that protect me from COVID-19? Mm -hmm. A really good question, actually. We did receive that question also at the INR Center. Um, a person had called about that. Um, we don't have evidence um, that amantadine will protect from COVID. Um, the, you know, the influenza A is different than, um, you know, certainly the COVID virus. Um, so my answer would be that there's not evidence right now to yeah. um, say that with certainty or, right. or any certainty. So we're going to take one last question. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with some APA resources that may be helpful for our audience. Um, a lot of people are worrying about shortages of Parkinson's disease medication. One, because plants may be in China and, and there's been difficulty with uh, trade in this period of time. Um, or for any other reason, um, deflection of resources to making other medications, whatnot. Um, do we know about any Parkinson's disease medication shortages? Is that something we need to be worrying about? Yes. So, so sometimes we're the last to know, um, but we, um, there have not been any that I am aware of. Um, in the past, we've certainly had shortages as, you know, a medication, you know, has gone completely generic. So maybe the um, trade medication, is, there's a shortage. Um, I have not heard of this. Um, certainly, I think we're all aware of it. Um, and it is important to, you know, start, we don't want to hoard medication, but I think the current state is to, if possible, have a three-month supply for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I know some insurance plans require a one-month supply of medications, and certainly medications that are controlled substances can only be delivered monthly. But there has been some easing of restrictions. So, um, if possible, if you could have that on hand, um, you know, in these times. Um, but I'm not familiar with any specific shortages of medicines. Yeah, that's uh, wise advice, and I agree. I haven't heard of any, and hopefully that's how it'll exactly. stay. Um, on that note, um, I want to uh, start wrapping up our session by presenting some APDA resources about medications for Parkinson's disease that our audience may find helpful. Uh, we have uh, publications about medications approved for the treatment of PD in the United States, medications to be avoided or to use with caution in Parkinson's disease, and these can be downloaded. Anyone who's on the session today, we will email you these resources so you don't, you don't have to write this all down. Um, we also have webinars uh, that, can, that are archived that you can access which go into um, more detail about specific medications and how they can be used to help you maximize your functioning during the day, um, as well as uh, blogs and articles that tackle some of these issues that we touched on today about best uses and practices of using your medication. I also want to point out our APDA Symptom Tracker app. Uh, this is available for download. Uh, from various uh, avenues, uh, Google Play and 
um, other uh, app download uh, sites, depending on your device. Um, and this uh, app, which you will then have on your mobile device, will allow you to track your symptoms um, the next iteration will actually allow you to track your medications and your responses to the various medications during the times of day. So this is a great resource to stay organized, keep your symptoms in an organized fashion so that you have that information when you go to your doctor, which of course you do much more uh, intermittently than you would want to track your symptoms. So this uh, symptom tracker app can be extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. So feel free to use it and uh, uh, benefit from from some of the things that we discussed today that are embedded in the app. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, um, I want to uh, just present our uh, information about APDA. As I mentioned, our website, apdaparkinson.org, our toll-free helpline, 1-800-223-2732, and we can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, please contact us, find out more about our programs and services, and of course, um, to donate in this uh, difficult time, uh, we need to, uh, to uh, continue giving our, our Parkinson's disease families all the resources that we can, and for that we need continued support from our community. So if you can donate, please do so at APDAPark.org. I want to take this opportunity to thank Kathy Thomas for her fantastic responses and excellent information to help us navigate medication management during this difficult time of COVID-19. A lot of good questions, a lot of good answers. If you missed any part of this broadcast, it will be, it has been recorded and will be available on our website in the next few days. You can listen to it again or share it with others. So on that note, thank you so much, Kathy. And I hope everybody out there has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, thank you very much.